Chapter 7 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerke. Chapter 7, Part 3 Planets and Satellites. The Moon possesses for us a unique interest. She, in all probability, shared the origin of the earth. She, perhaps, prefigures its decay. She is at present its minister and companion. Her existence, so far as we can see, serves no other purpose than to illuminate the darkness of terrestrial nights, and to measure, by swiftly recurring and conspicuous changes of aspect, the long span of terrestrial time. Inquiries stimulated by visible dependence and aided by relatively close vicinity have resulted in a wonderfully minute acquaintance with the features of the single lunar hemisphere open to our inspection. Selenography in the modern sense, is little more than a hundred years old. It originated with the publication in 1791 of Schurter's Selenotopographische Fragmente. Not but that the lunar surface had already been diligently studied, chiefly by Hevelius, Cassini, Riccioli, and Tobias Mayer. The idea, however, of investigating the moon's physical condition and detecting symptoms of the activity there of natural forces through minute topographical inquiry first obtained effect at Lilienthal. Schurter's delineations, accordingly, imperfect though they were, afforded a starting point for a comparative study of the superficial features of our satellite. The first of the curious objects, which he named Rills, was noted by him in 1787. Before 1801, he had found 11. Lormann added 75, Madler 55. Schmidt published, in 1866, a catalogue of 425, of which 278 had been detected by himself, and he eventually brought the number up to nearly 1,000. They are then a very persistent lunar feature, though wholly without terrestrial analogue. There is no difference of opinion as to their nature. They are quite obviously clefts in a rocky surface 100 to 500 yards deep, usually a couple of miles across, and pursuing straight, curved, or branching tracks up to 150 miles in length. As regards their origin, the most probable view is that they are fissures produced in cooling, but Nyssen inclines to consider them rather as dried water courses. On February 24, 1792, Schurter perceived what he took to be distinct traces of a lunar twilight, and continued to observe them during nine consecutive years. They indicated, he thought, the presence of a shallow atmosphere, about twenty-nine times more tenuous than our own. Bessel, on the other hand, considered that the only way of saving a lunar atmosphere was to deny it any refractive power, the sharpness and suddenness of star occultations, negativing the possibility of gaseous surroundings of greater density, admitting an extreme supposition, than one of five hundred that of terrestrial air. Newcomb places the maximum at one of four hundred. Sir John Herschel concluded, the non-existence of any atmosphere at the moon's edge having a 1 in 1,980 part of the density of the Earth's atmosphere. This decision was fully borne out by Sir William Huggins' spectroscopic observation of the disappearance behind the moon's limb of the small star E. Piscium, January 4, 1865. Not the slightest sign of selective absorption or unequal refraction was discernible. The entire spectrum went out at once, as if a slide had suddenly dropped over it. The spectroscope has uniformly told the same tale, 
for m tolan's observation during the total solar eclipse at sohag of a supposed thickening at the moon's rim of certain dark lines in the solar spectrum is now acknowledged to have been illusory moonlight analyzed with the prism is found to be pure reflected sunlight diminished in quantity owing to the low reflective capability of the lunar surface to less than one-fifth its incident intensity but wholly unmodified in quality nevertheless the diameter of the moon appeared from the greenwich observations discussed by airy in eighteen sixty five to be four minutes smaller than when directly measured and the effect would be explicable by refraction in a lunar atmosphere two thousand times thinner than our own at the sea level but the difference was probably illusory it resulted in part if not wholly from the visual enlargement by irradiation of the bright disk of the moon professor comstock employing the sixteen-inch clark equatorial of the washburn observatory found in eighteen ninety seven the refractive displacements of occulted stars so trifling as to preclude the existence of a permanent lunar atmosphere of much more than one in five thousand the density of the terrestrial envelope the possibility however was admitted that on the illuminated side of the moon temporary exhalations of aqueous vapor might arise from ice strata evaporated by sun-heat meantime some renewed evidence of actual crepuscular gleams on the moon had been gathered by messrs paul and prosper henry of the paris observatory as well as by mr w h pickering in the pure air of arequipa at an altitude of eight thousand feet above the sea an occultation of jupiter too observed by him august twelfth eighteen ninety two was attended with a slight flattening of the planet's disk through the effect it was supposed of lunar refraction but of refraction in an atmosphere possessing at most one of four thousand the density at the sea level of terrestrial air and capable of holding in equilibrium no more than one two hundred and fiftieth of an inch of mercury yet the small barometric value corresponds mr pickering remarks to a pressure of hundreds of tons per square mile of the lunar surface the compression downward of gaseous strata on the moon should in any case proceed very gradually owing to the slight power of lunar gravity and they might hence play an important part in the economy of our satellite while evading spectroscopic and other tests thus as mr raynard remarked the cliffs and pinnacles of the moon bear witness by their unworn condition to the efficiency of atmospheric protection against meteoric bombardment and mr pickering shows that it could be afforded by such a tenuous envelope as that postulated by him the first to emulate schroeter's selenographal zeal was wilhelm gotthelf lormann a land surveyor of dresden who in eighteen twenty four published four out of twenty five sections of the first scientifically executed lunar chart on a scale of thirty seven and a half inches to a lunar diameter his sight however began to fail three years later and he died in eighteen forty leaving materials from which the work was completed and published in eighteen seventy eight by dr julius schmidt late director of the athens observatory much had been done in the interim beer and madler began at berlin in eighteen thirty their great trigonometrical survey of the lunar surface as yet neither revised nor superseded a map issued in four parts eighteen thirty four through thirty six on nearly the same scale as lormann's but more detailed and authoritative embodied the results it was succeeded in eighteen thirty seven by a descriptive volume bearing the imposing title dermond oder allgemeine vergleichende selenographie this summation of knowledge in that branch though in truth leaving many questions open had an air of finality which tended to discourage further inquiry it gave form 
to a reaction against the sanguine views entertained by Hevelius, Schroeter, Herschel, and Grutthuisen. As to the possibilities of agreeable residence on the moon, and relegated the Selenites, one of whose cities Schroeter thought he had discovered, and of whose festal processions Grutthuisen had not despaired of becoming a spectator, to the shadowy land of the Ivory Gate. All examples of change in lunar formations were, moreover, dismissed as illusory. The light contained in the work was, in short, a dry light, not stimulating to the imagination. A mixture of lie, Bacon shrewdly remarks, doth ever add pleasure. For many years, accordingly, Schmidt had the field of selenography almost to himself. Reviving interest in the subject was at once excited and displayed by the appointment in 1864 of a lunar committee of the British Association. The indirect were of greater value than the direct fruits of its labors. The English school of selenography rose into importance. Popularity was gained for the subject by the diffusion of works conspicuous for ingenuity and research. Nathsmith's and Carpenter's beautiful illustrated volume, 1874, was succeeded after two years by a still more weighty contribution to lunar science in Mr. Nyson's well-known book, accompanied by a map based on the survey of Beer and Madler, but adding some 500 measures of positions, beside the representation of several thousand new objects. With Schmidt's Charta der Gebirge der Mondes, Germany once more took the lead. This splendid delineation, built upon Lormann's foundation, embraced the detail contained in upwards of 3,000 original drawings representing the labor of 34 years. No less than 32,856 craters are represented in it, on a scale of 75 inches to a diameter. An additional help to lunar inquiries was provided at the same time in this country by the establishment, through the initiative of the late Mr. W. R. Bert, of the Selenographical Society. But the strongest incentive to diligence in studying the rugged features of our celestial helpmate has been the idea of probable or actual variation in them. A change always seems to the inquisitive intellect of man like a breach in the defenses of nature's secrets through which it may hope to make its way to the citadel. What is desirable easily becomes credible, and thus statements and rumors of lunar convulsions have successively, during the last hundred years, obtained credence, and successively, on closer investigation, been rejected. The subject is one as to which illusion is peculiarly easy. Our view of the moon's surface is a bird's-eye view, its conformation reveals itself indirectly, through irregularities in the distribution of light and darkness. The forms of its elevations and depressions can be inferred only from the shapes of the black, unmitigated shadows cast by them. But these shapes are in a state of perpetual and bewildering fluctuation, partly through changes in the angle of illumination, partly through changes in our point of view, caused by what are called the moon's librations. The result is that no single observation can be exactly repeated by the same observer, since identical conditions recur only after the lapse of a great number of years. Local peculiarities of surface, besides, are liable to produce perplexing effects. The reflection of earth light at a particular angle from certain bright summits completely though temporarily, deceived Herschel in the belief that he had witnessed, in 1783 and 1787, volcanic outbursts on the dark side of the moon. The persistent recurrence, indeed, of similar appearances under circumstances less amenable to explanation inclined Webb to the view that effusions of native light actually occur. More cogent proofs must, however, be adduced before a fact so intrinsically improbable can be admitted as true. But from the publication of Beer and Madler's work, until 1866, the received opinion was that no genuine sign of activity had ever been seen, 
or was likely to be seen on our satellite that her face was a stereotyped page a fixed and irreversible record of the past a profound sensation accordingly was produced by schmidt's announcement in october eighteen sixty six that the crater linnae and the mare serenitatis had disappeared effaced as it was supposed by an igneous outflow the case seemed undeniable and is still dubious linne had been known to lorman and madler eighteen twenty two to thirty two as a deep crater five or six miles in diameter the third largest in the dusky plain known as the mare serenitatis and schmidt had observed and drawn it eighteen forty to forty three under a practically identical aspect now it appears under high light as a whitish spot in the centre of which as the rays begin to fall obliquely a pit scarcely two miles across emerges into view the crateral character of the comparatively minute depression was detected by father seshi february eleventh eighteen sixty seven this is not all scherter's description of linne as seen by him november fifth seventeen eighty eight tallies quite closely with modern observation while its inconspicuous in seventeen ninety seven is shown by its omission from russell's lunar globe and maps we are thus driven to adopt one of two suppositions either lormann madler and schmidt were entirely mistaken in the size and importance of linne or a real change in its outward semblance supervened during the first half of the century and has since passed away perhaps again to recur the latter hypothesis seems the more probable and its probability is strengthened by much evidence of actual obscuration or variation of tint in other parts of the lunar surface more especially on the floor of the great walled plain named plato from a re-examination with a thirteen-inch refractor at arequipa in eighteen ninety one to ninety two of this region and of the mare serenitatis mr w h pickering inclines to the belief that lunar volcanic action once apparently so potent is not yet wholly extinct an instance of the opposite kind of change was alleged by dr hermann j klein of Cologne in march eighteen seventy eight in linne the obliteration of an old crater had been assumed in hyginus n the formation of a new crater was asserted yet quite possibly the same cause may have produced the effects thought to be apparent in both it is however far from certain that any real change has affected the neighbourhood of hyginus the novelty of klein's observation of may nineteenth eighteen seventy seven may have consisted simply in the detection of a hitherto unrecognized feature the region is one of complex formation consequently of more than ordinary liability to deceptive variations in aspect under rapid and entangled fluctuations of light and shade moreover it seems to be certain from Messrs. pratt and capron's attentive study that hyginus n is no true crater but a shallow saucer-like depression difficult of clear discernment under suitable illumination nevertheless it contains and is marked by an ample shadow in both these controverted instances of change lunar photography was invoked as a witness but notwithstanding the great advances made in the art by de la rue in this country by draper and above all by rutherford in america without decisive results investigations of the kind began to assume a new aspect in eighteen ninety when professor holden organized them at the lick observatory autographic moon pictures were no longer taken casually but on system and dr weineck's elaborate study and skilful reproductions of them at prague gave them universal value they were designed to provide materials for an atlas on the scale of beer and madlers of which some beautiful specimen plates have been issued 
at Paris in 1894 with the aid of a large equatorial code. A work of similar character was set on foot by Messrs. Louvi and Puceau. Its progress has been marked by the successive publication of five installments of a splendid atlas on a scale of about eight feet to the lunar diameter, accompanied by theoretical dissertations designed to establish a science of selenology. The moon's formations are thus not only delineated under every variety of light incidents, but their meaning is sought to be elicited and their history and mutual relations interpreted. Henceforth, at any rate, the lunar volcanoes can scarcely, without notice taken, breathe hard in their age-long sleep. Maloney was the first to get undeniable heating effects from moonlight. His experiments, made on Mount Vesuvius early in 1846, were repeated with like result by Zantadeschi at Venice, four years later. A rough measure of the intensity of those effects was arrived at by Piazzi Smith at Guajara, on the peak of Tenerife in 1856. At a distance of 15 feet from the thermal multiplier, a Price's candle was found to radiate just twice as much heat as the full moon. Then, after 13 years, in 1869 to 72, an exact and extensive series of observations on the subject were made by the present Earl of Rosse. The lunar radiations from the first to the last quarter displayed, when concentrated with the Parsonstown three-foot mirror, appreciable thermal energy, increasing with the phase, and largely due to dark heat, distinguished from the quicker vibrating sort by inability to traverse a plate of glass. This was supposed to indicate an actual heating of the surface during the long lunar day of 300 hours to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, corrected later to 197 degrees, the moon thus acting as a direct radiator, no less than as a reflector of heat. But the conclusion was very imperfectly borne out by Dr. Burdick's observations with the same instrument and apparatus during the total lunar eclipse of October 4, 1884. This initial opportunity of measuring the heat phases of an eclipsed moon was used with the remarkable result of showing that the heat disappeared almost completely, though not quite simultaneously, with the light. Confirmatory evidence of the extraordinary promptitude with which our satellite parts with heat, already to some extent appropriated, was afforded by Professor Langley's bolometric observations at Allegheny of the partial eclipse of September 23, 1885. Yet it is certain that the moon sends us a perceptible quantity of heat on its own account, besides simply throwing back solar radiations. For in February 1885, Professor Langley succeeded, after many fruitless attempts, in getting measures of a lunar heat spectrum. The incredible delicacy of the operation may be judged of from the statement that the sum total of the thermal energy dispersed by his rock-salt prisms was insufficient to raise a thermometer fully exposed to it one thousandth of a degree centigrade. The singular fact was, however, elicited that this almost evanescent spectrum is made up of two superposed spectra, one due to reflection, the other, with a maximum far down in the infrared, to radiation. The corresponding temperature of the moon's sunlit surface, Professor Langley considers to be about that of freezing water. Repeated experiments have failed to get any thermal effects from the dark part of the moon. It was inferred that our satellite has no internal heat sensible at the surface, so that the radiations from the lunar soil, giving the low maximum in the heat spectrum, must be due purely to solar heat, which has been absorbed and almost immediately re-radiated. Professor Langley's explorations of the terra incognita of immensely long wavelengths 
where lie the unseen heat emissions from the earth into space led him to the discovery that these contrary to the received opinion are in good part transmissible by our atmosphere although they are completely intercepted by glass another important result of the allegheny work was the abolition of the anomalous notion of the temperature of space fixed by poilet at minus one hundred and forty degrees centigrade for space itself can have no temperature and stellar radiation is a negligible quantity thus it is safe to assume that a perfect thermometer suspended in space at the distance of the earth or moon from the sun but shielded from its rays would sensibly indicate the absolute zero ordinarily placed at minus two hundred and seventy three degrees centigrade a prize essay on the distribution of the moon's heat the hague eighteen ninety one by mr frank w very who had taken an active part in professor langley's long sustained inquiry embodies the fruits of its continuation they show the lunar disk to be tolerably uniform in thermal power the brighter parts are also indeed hotter but not much the traces perceived of a slight retention of heat by the substances forming the lunar surface agreed well with the parsons town observations of the total eclipse of the moon january twenty eighth eighteen eighty eight for they brought out an unmistakable divergence between the heat and light phases a curious decrease of heat previous to the first touch of the earth's shadow upon the lunar globe remains unexplained unless it be admissible to suppose the terrestrial atmosphere capable of absorbing heat at an elevation of a hundred and ninety miles the probable range of temperature on the moon was discussed by professor very in eighteen ninety eight he concluded it to be very wide hotter than boiling water under the sun's vertical rays the arid surface of our dependent globe must he found cool in the fourteen-day lunar night to about the temperature of liquid air although that fundamental part of astronomy known as celestial mechanics lies outside the scope of this work and we therefore pass over in silence the immense labors of plana de Mousseau, hansen de Lanay, g w hill and airy in reconciling the observed and calculated motions of the moon there is one slight but significant discrepancy which is of such importance to the physical history of the solar system that some brief mention must be made of it haley discovered in sixteen ninety three by examining the records of ancient eclipses that the moon was going faster then than two thousand years previously so much faster as to have got ahead of the place in the sky she would otherwise have occupied by about two of her own diameters it was one of laplace's highest triumphs to have found an explanation of this puzzling fact he showed in seventeen eighty seven that it was due to a very slow change in the ovalness of the earth's orbit tending during the present age of the world to render it more nearly circular the pull of the sun upon the moon is thereby lessened the counterpull of the earth gets the upper hand and our satellite drawn nearer to us by something less than an inch per year proportionately quickens her pace many thousands of years hence the process will be reversed the terrestrial orbit will close in at the sides the lunar orbit will open out under the growing stress of solar gravity and our celestial chronometer will lose instead of gaining time this is all quite true as laplace put it but it is not enough adams the virtual discoverer of neptune found with surprise in eighteen fifty three that the received account of the matter was essentially incomplete and explained when the requisite correction was introduced only half the observed acceleration what was to be done with the remaining half here delaunay the eminent french mathematical astronomer unhappily drowned at cherbourg in eighteen seventy two by the capsizing of a pleasure boat 
came to the rescue. It is obvious to anyone who considers the subject a little attentively that the tides must act to some extent as a friction break upon the rotating earth. In other words, they must bring about an almost infinitely slow lengthening of the day, for the two masses of water piled up by lunar influence on the hither and farther sides of our globe strive, as it were, to detach themselves from the unity of the terrestrial spheroid and to follow the movements of the moon. The moon, accordingly, holds them against the whirling earth, which revolves like a shaft in a fixed collar, slowly losing motion and gaining heat, eventually dissipated through space. This must go on, so far as we can see, until the periods of the Earth's rotation and of the Moon's revolution coincide. Nay, the process will be continued, should our oceans survive so long, by the feebler tide-raising power of the Sun, seizing only when day and night cease to alternate, when one side of our planet is plunged in perpetual darkness and the other seared by unchanging light. Here, then, we have the secret of the moon's turning, always the same face towards the earth. It is that in primeval times, when the moon was liquid or plastic, an earth-raised tidal wave rapidly and forcibly reduced her rotation to its present exact agreement with her period of revolution. This was divined by Kant nearly a century before the necessity for such a mode of action presented itself to any other thinker. In a weekly paper published at Kernigsberg in 1754, the modern doctrine of tidal friction was clearly outlined by him, both as regards its effects actually in progress on the rotation of the earth, and as regards its effects already consummated on the rotation of the moon the whole forming a preliminary attempt at what he called a natural history of the heavens. His sagacious suggestion, however, remained entirely unnoticed, until revived, it would seem independently, by Julius Robert Mayer in 1848, while similar and probably original conclusions were reached by William Farrell of Allensville, Kentucky in 1858. Delaunay was not then the inventor or discoverer of tidal friction. He merely displayed it as an effective cause of change. He showed reason for believing that its action in checking the Earth's rotation, far from being, as Ferrell had supposed, completely neutralized by the contraction of the globe through cooling, was a fact to be reckoned with in computing the movements, as well as in speculating on the history of the heavenly bodies. The outstanding acceleration of the moon was thus at once explained. It was explained as apparent only, the reflection of a real lengthening by one second in one hundred thousand years of the day. But on this point, the last word has not yet been spoken. Professor Newcomb undertook in 1870 the onerous task of investigating the errors of Hansen's lunar tables as compared with observations prior to 1750. The results, published in 1878, proved somewhat perplexing. They tend, in general, to reduce the amount of acceleration left unaccounted for by Laplace's gravitational theory and proportionately to diminish the importance of the part played by tidal friction. But, in order to bring about this diminution, and at the same time conciliate Alexandrian and Arabian observations, it is necessary to reject, as total, the ancient solar eclipses known as those of Tails and Larissa. This may be a necessary, but it must be admitted to be a hazardous expedient. Its upshot was to indicate a possibility that the observed and calculated values of the moon's acceleration might, after all, prove to be identical, and the small outstanding discrepancy was still further diminished by Tisserand's investigation, differently conducted on the same Arabian eclipses discussed by Newcomb. The necessity of having recourse to a lengthening day is then less pressing 
than it seen some time ago and the effect if perceptible in the moon's motion should m tisserand remarked be proportionately so in the motions of all the other heavenly bodies the presence of the apparent general acceleration that should ensue can be tested with most promise of success according to the same authority by delicate comparisons of past and future transits of mercury newcomb further showed that small residual irregularities are still found in the movements of our satellite inexplicable either by any known gravitational influence or by any uniform value that could be assigned to secular acceleration if set down to the account of imperfections in the timekeeping of the earth it could only be on the arbitrary supposition of fluctuations in its rate of going themselves needing explanation this it is true might be found in very slight changes of figure not altogether unlikely to occur but into this cloudy and speculative region astronomers for the present decline to penetrate they prefer if possible to deal only with calculable causes and thus to preserve for their most perfect of sciences its special prerogative of assured prediction end of chapter seven part three chapter eight of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerk Chapter 8 Part 1 Planets and Satellites Continued Part 1 The analogy between Mars and the Earth is perhaps by far the greatest in the whole solar system. So Herschel wrote in 1783 and so we may safely say today after six score further years of scrutiny the circumstance lends a particular interest to inquiries into the physical habitudes of our exterior planetary neighbor fontana first caught glimpses at naples in sixteen thirty six and sixteen thirty eight of dusky stains on the ruddy disk of mars they were next seen by Hook and Cassini in 1666, and this time with sufficient distinctness to serve as indices to the planet's rotation, determined by the latter as taking place in a period of 24 hours 40 minutes. Increased confidence was given to this result through Moraldi's precise verification of it in 1719. Among the spots observed by him, he distinguished two as stable in position though variable in size they were of a peculiar character showing as bright patches round the poles and had already been noticed during the sixty years back a current conjecture of their snowy nature obtained validity when herschel connected their fluctuations in extent with the progress of the martian seasons the inference of frozen precipitations could scarcely be resisted when once it was clearly perceived that the shining polar zones did actually by turns diminish and grow with the alternations of summer and winter in the corresponding hemisphere this it may be said was the opening of our acquaintance with the state of things prevailing on the surface of mars it was accompanied by a steady assertion, on Herschel's part, of permanence in the dark markings, notwithstanding partial obscurations by clouds and vapors floating in a considerable but moderate atmosphere. Hence, the presumed inhabitants of the planet were inferred to probably enjoy a situation in many respects similar to ours. Schroeter, on the other hand, went altogether wide of the truth as regards mars he held that the surface visible to us is a mere shell 
of drifting cloud deriving a certain amount of apparent stability from the influence on evaporation and condensation of subjacent but unseen areographical features and his opinion prevailed with his contemporaries it was however rejected by kanowski in eighteen twenty two and finally overthrown by beer in madler's careful studies during five consecutive oppositions eighteen thirty through thirty nine they identified at each the same dark spots frequently blurred with mists especially when the local winter prevailed but fundamentally unchanged in eighteen sixty two lockyer established a marvelous agreement with beer and madler's results of eighteen thirty leaving no doubt as to the complete fixity of the main features amid daily nay hourly variations of detail through transits of clouds on seventeen nights of the same opposition f kaiser of leyden obtained drawings in which nearly all the markings noted in eighteen thirty at berlin reappeared besides spots frequently seen respectively by arago in eighteen thirteen by herschel in seventeen eighty three and one sketched by haugens in sixteen seventy two with a writing pen in his diary from these data the leyden observer arrived at a period of rotation of twenty four hours thirty seven minutes twenty two point sixty two seconds being just one second shorter than that deduced exclusively from their own observations by beer and madler the exactness of this result was practically confirmed by the inquiries of professor bakuzin of leyden using for a middle term of comparison the disinterred observations of schroter with those of haugens at one and of schiaparelli at the other end of an interval of two hundred and twenty years he was enabled to show with something like certainty that the time of rotation twenty four hours thirty seven minutes twenty two point seven three five seconds ascribed to mars by mr proctor in reliance on a drawing executed by hook in sixteen sixty six was too long by nearly one tenth of a second the minuteness of the correction indicates the nicety of care employed nor employed vainly for owing to the comparative antiquity of the records available in this case an almost infinitesimal error becomes so multiplied by frequent repetition as to produce palpable discrepancies in the positions of the markings at distant dates hence bakusen's period of twenty four hours thirty seven minutes twenty two point sixty six seconds is undoubtedly of a precision unapproached as regards any other heavenly body save the earth itself two facts bearing on the state of things at the surface of mars were then fully acquired to science in or before the year eighteen sixty two the first was that of the seasonal fluctuations of the polar spots the second that of the general permanence of certain dark gray or greenish patches perceived with the telescope as standing out from the deep yellow ground of the disk that these varieties of tint correspond to the real diversities of a terraqueous globe the ripe cornfield sections representing land the dusky spots and streaks oceans and straits has long been the prevalent opinion sir j herschel in eighteen thirty led the way in ascribing the redness of the planet's light to an inherent peculiarity of soil previously it had been assimilated to our sunset glows rather than to our red sandstone formations set down that is to an atmospheric stoppage of blue rays but the extensive martian atmosphere implicitly believed in on the strength of some erroneous observations by cassini and Romer in the seventeenth century vanished before the sharp occultation of a small star in leo witnessed by sir james south in eighteen twenty two and dawes's observation in eighteen sixty five that the ruddy tinge is deepest near the central parts of the disk certified its non-atmospheric origin 
the absolute whiteness of the polar snow-caps was alleged in support of the same inference by sir william huggins in eighteen sixty seven all recent operations tend to show that the atmosphere of mars is much thinner than our own this was to have been expected a priori since the same proportionate mass of air would on his smaller globe form a relatively sparse covering besides gravity there possesses less than four tenths its force here so that this sparser covering would weigh less and be less condensed than if it enveloped the earth atmospheric pressure would accordingly be of about two and a quarter instead of fifteen terrestrial pounds per square inch this corresponds with what the telescope shows us it is extremely doubtful whether any features of the earth's actual surface could be distinguished by a planetary spectator however well provided with optical assistance professor langley's inquiries led him to conclude that fully twice as much light is absorbed by our air as had previously been supposed say forty per cent of vertical rays in a clear sky of the sixty reaching the earth less than a quarter would be reflected even from white sandstone and this quarter would again pay heavy toll in escaping back to space thus not more than perhaps ten or twelve out of the original hundred sent by the sun would under the most favorable circumstances and from the very center of the earth's disk reach the eye of a martian or lunar observer the light by which he views our world is there is little doubt light reflected from the various strata of our atmosphere cloud or mist laden or serene as the case may be with an occasional snow mountain figuring as a permanent white spot this consideration at once shows us how much more tenuous the martian air must be since it admits of topographical delineations of the martian globe the clouds too that form in it seem in general to be rather of the nature of ground mists than of heavy cumulus occasionally indeed durable and extensive strata become visible during the latter half of october eighteen ninety four for instance a region as large as europe remained apparently cloud covered yet most recent observers are unable to detect the traces of aqueous absorption in the martian spectrum noted by huggins in eighteen sixty seven and by vogel in eighteen seventy three campbell vainly looked for them visually in eighteen ninety four spectrographically in eighteen ninety six keeler was equally unsuccessful jewell holds that they could with present appliances only be perceived if the atmosphere of mars were much richer in water vapor than that of the earth there can be little doubt however that its supply is about the minimum adequate to the needs of a living and perhaps a life nurturing planet the climate of mars seems to be unexpectedly mild its theoretical mean temperature taking into account both distance from the sun and albedo is thirty four degrees centigrade below freezing yet its polar snows are both less extensive and less permanent than those on the earth the southern white hood noticed by schiaparelli in eighteen seventy seven to have survived the summer only as a small lateral patch melted completely in eighteen ninety four moreover mr w h pickering observed with astonishment the disappearance in the course of thirty-three days of june and july eighteen ninety two of one million six hundred thousand square miles of southern snow curiously enough the initial stage of shrinkage in the white calotte was marked by its division into two unequal parts as if in obedience to the mysterious principle of duplication governing so many martian phenomena changes of the hues associated respectively with land and water accompanied in lower latitudes and were thought to be occasioned by floods ensuing upon this rapid antarctic thaw 
it is true that scarcity of moisture would account for the scantiness and transitoriness of snowy deposits easily liquefied because thinly spread but we might expect to see the whole wintry hemisphere at any rate frost-bound since the sun radiates less than half as much heat on mars as on earth water seems nevertheless to remain as a rule uncongealed everywhere outside the polar regions we are at a loss to imagine by what beneficent arrangement the rigorous conditions naturally to be looked for can be modified into a climate which might be found tolerable by creatures constituted like ourselves martian topography may be said to form nowadays a separate sub-department of descriptive astronomy the amount of detail becomes legible by close scrutiny on a little disk which once in fifteen years attains a maximum of about one five thousandth the area of the full moon must excite surprise and might provoke incredulity spurious discoveries however have little chance of holding their own where there are so many competitors quite as ready to dispute as to confirm the first really good map of mars was constructed in eighteen sixty nine by proctor from drawings by dawes kaiser of leyden followed in eighteen seventy two with a representation founded upon data of his own providing in eighteen sixty two to sixty four and turby in his valuable areography presented to the brussels academy in eighteen seventy three a careful discussion of all important observations from the time of fontana downwards thus virtually adding to the knowledge by summarizing and digesting it the memorable opposition of september fifth eighteen seventy seven marked a fresh epoch in the study of mars while executing a trigonometrical survey the first attempted of the disk then of the unusual size of twenty-five foot across g v schiaparelli director of the milan observatory detected a novel and curious feature what had been taken from martian continents were found to be in point of fact agglomerations of islands separated from each other by a network of so-called canals more properly channels these are obviously extensions of quote, seas originating and terminating in them and sharing their gray-green hue but running sometimes to a length of three or four thousand miles in a straight line and preserving throughout a nearly uniform breadth of about sixty miles further inquiries have fully substantiated the discovery made at the brera observatory the canals of mars are an actually existent and permanent phenomenon an examination of the drawings in his possession showed m turby that they had been seen though not distinctively recognized by dawes seshi and holden several were independently traced out by burton at the opposition of eighteen seventy nine all were recovered by schiaparelli himself in eighteen seventy nine and eighteen eighty one through eighty two and their indefinite multiplication resulted from lowell's observations in eighteen ninety four and eighteen ninety six when the planet culminated at midnight and was therefore in opposition december twenty sixth eighteen eighty one its distance was greater and its apparent diameter less than in eighteen seventy seven in the proportion of sixteen to twenty five its atmosphere was however more transparent and ours of less impediment to northern observers the object of scrutiny standing considerably higher in the northern skies never before at any rate had the true aspect of mars come out so clearly as at milan with the eight and three-quarter inch mertz refractor of the observatory between december eighteen eighty one and february eighteen eighty two the canals were all again there but this time they were as in many as twenty cases seen in duplicate that is to say a twin canal ran parallel to the original one at an interval 
of two hundred to four hundred miles we are here brought face to face with an apparently insoluble enigma schiaparelli regards the germination of his canals as a periodical phenomenon depending upon the martian seasons it is assuredly not an illusory one since it was plainly apparent during the opposition of eighteen eighty six to Messrs. perriton and tholen at nice and to the former using the new thirty inch refractor of that observatory in eighteen eighty eight mr a stanley williams with the help of only a six and a half inch reflector distinctly perceived in eighteen ninety seven of the duplicate objects noted at milan and the lick observations both of eighteen ninety and of eighteen ninety two together with the drawings made at flagstaff and mexico during the last favorable oppositions of the nineteenth century brought unequivocal confirmation to the accuracy of schiaparelli's impressions various conjectures have been hazarded in explanation of this bizarre appearance the difficulty of conceiving a physical reality corresponding to it has suggested recourse to an optical rationale proctor regarded it as an effect of diffraction stanislas munier of oblique reflection from overlying mist banks flammarion considers it possible that companion canals might under special circumstances be evoked by refraction as a kind of mirage but none of these speculations are really admissible when all the facts are taken into account the view that the canals of mars are vast rifts due to the cooling of the globe is recommended by the circumstance that they tend to follow great circles nevertheless it would break down if as schiaparelli holds the fluctuations in their divisibility depend upon actual obliterations and re-emergences fantastic though the theory of their artificial origin appear it is held by serious astronomers its vogue is largely due to mr lowell's ingenious advocacy he considers the martian globe to be everywhere intersected by an elaborate system of irrigation works rendered necessary by a perennial water famine relieved periodically by the melting of the polar snows nor does he admit the existence of oceans or lakes what have been taken for such are really tracts covered with vegetation the bright areas intermixed with them representing sandy deserts and it is noteworthy in this connection that professor barnard obtained in eighteen ninety four with the great lick refractor suggestive and impressive views disclosing details of light and shade on the gray-green patches so intricate and minute as almost to preclude the supposition of their aqueous nature the closeness of the terrestrial analogy has thus of late been much impaired even if the surface of mars be composed of land and water their distribution must be of a completely original type the interlacing everywhere of continents with arms of the sea if that be the correct interpretation of the visual effects implies that their levels scarcely differ and schiaparelli carries most observers with him in holding that their outlines are not absolutely constant encroachments of dusky upon bright tints suggesting extensive inundations the late any green's observations at madeira in 1877 indicated on the other hand a rugged south polar region the contour of the snow cap not only appeared indented as if by valleys and promontories but brilliant points that were discerned outside the white area attributed to isolated snow peaks still more elevated if similarly explained must be the ice island first seen in comparatively low latitude by dawes in january eighteen sixty five on august fourth eighteen ninety two mars stood opposite to the sun at a distance of only thirty four million eight hundred and sixty five thousand miles from the earth in point of vicinity then its situation was scarcely less favorable than in eighteen seventy seven the low altitude of the planet however practically neutralized this advantage for northern observers and 
public expectation, which had been raised to the highest pitch by the announcements of sensation-mongers, was somewhat disappointed at the meagerness of the news authentically received from Mars. Valuable series of observations were nevertheless made at Lick and Arequipa, and they unite in testifying to the genuine prevalence of surface variability, especially in certain regions of intermediate tint, and perhaps of the crude consistence of boggy sirtes neither sea nor good dry land. Professor Holden insisted on the enormous difficulties in the way of completely explaining the recorded phenomenon by terrestrial analogies. Mr. W. H. Pickering spoke of conspicuous and startling changes. They, however, merely overlaid and partially disguised a general stability. Among the novelties detected by Mr. Pickering were a number of lakes, or oases, in Lowell's phraseology, under the aspect of black dots at the junction of two or more canals. And he, no less than Lick astronomers and Mr. Perrotin at Nice, observed brilliant clouds projecting beyond the terminator or above the limb, while carried round by the planet's rotation. They seemed to float at an altitude of at least twenty miles, or about four times the height of terrestrial cirrus. But this was not wonderful, considering the low power of gravity acting upon them. Great capital was made in the journalistic interest out of these imaginary signals from intelligent Martians, desirous of opening communications with, to them, problematical terrestrial beings. Similar effects had, however, been seen before by Mr. Knobel in 1873, and by Mr. Turby in 1888 at the Lick Observatory in 1890, and they were discerned again with particular distinctness by Professor Husey at Lick, August 27, 1896. The first photograph of Mars was taken by Gould at Cordoba in 1879. Little real service in planetary delineation has, it is true, been so far rendered by the art yet one achievement must be recorded to its credit. A set of photographs obtained by Mr. W. H. Pickering on Wilson's Peak, California, April 9, 1890, showed the southern polar cap of Mars as of moderate dimensions, but with a large, dim, adjacent area. Twenty-four hours later, on a corresponding set, the dim area was brilliantly white, the polar cap had become enlarged in the interim, apparently though a wide spreading snowfall by the annexation of a territory equal to that of the United States. The season was towards the close of winter in Mars. Never until then had the process of glacial extension been actually, it might be said, superintended in that distant globe. Mars was gratuitously supplied with a pair of satellites, long before he was found actually to possess them. Kepler interpreted Galileo's anagram of the triple Saturn in this sense. They were perceived by Micromegas on his long voyage through space, and the Laputan astronomers had even arrived at a knowledge curiously accurate under the circumstances of their distances and periods. But terrestrial observers could see nothing of them until the night of August 11, 1877. The planet was then within one month of its second nearest approach to the Earth during the last century. And in 1845, the Washington 26-inch refractor was not in existence. Professor Asaph Hall, accordingly, determined to turn the conjecture to account for an exhaustive inquiry into the surroundings of Mars. Keeping his glaring disk just outside the field of view, a minute attendant speck of light was glimpsed August 11. Bad weather, however, intervened, and it was not until the 16th that it was ascertained to be what it appeared, a satellite. 
on the following evening a second still nearer to the primary was discovered which by the bewildering rapidity of its passages hither and thither produced at first the effect of quite a crowd of little moons but these delicate objects have since been repeatedly observed both in europe and america even with comparatively small instruments at the opposition of eighteen eighty four indeed the distance of the planet was too great to permit the detection of both elsewhere than at washington but the lick equatorial showed them july eighteenth eighteen eighty eight when their brightness was only zero point twelve its amount at the time of their discovery so that they can now be followed for a considerable time before and after the least favorable oppositions the names chosen for them were taken from the iliad where demos and phobos fear and panic are represented as the companions in the battle of ares in several respects they are interesting and remarkable bodies as to size they may be said to stand midway between meteorites and satellites from careful photometric measures executed at harvard in eighteen seventy seven and eighteen seventy nine professor pickering concluded their diameters to be respectively six and seven miles this is on the assumption that they reflect the same proportion of the light incident upon them that their primary does but it may very well be that they are less reflective in which case they would be more extensive the albedo of mars is put by Mueller at zero point two seven his surface in other words returns twenty seven per cent of the rays striking it if we put the albedo of his satellites equal to that of our moon zero point seventeen their diameters will be increased from six and seven to seven and a half and nine miles phobos the inner one being the larger mr lowell however formed a considerably larger estimate of their dimensions it is interesting to note that deimos according to professor pickering's very distinct perception does not share the reddish tint of mars deimos completes its nearly circular revolutions in thirty hours eighteen minutes at a distance from the surface of its ruling body of twelve thousand five hundred miles phobos traverses an elliptical orbit in seven hours thirty nine minutes twenty two seconds at a distance of only three thousand seven hundred and sixty miles this is the only known instance of a satellite circulating faster than its primary rotates and is a circumstance of some importance as regards theories of planetary development to a martian spectator the curious effect would ensue of a celestial object seemingly exempt from the general motion of the sphere rising in the west setting in the east and culminating twice or even thrice a day which moreover in latitudes above sixty nine degrees north or south would be permanently and altogether hidden by the intervening curvature of the globe End of chapter 8, part 1. Part 2. Chapter 8 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by agnes mary clerka chapter eight part two planets and satellites continued part two the detection of new members of the solar system has come to be one of the most ordinary of astronomical events since eighteen forty six no single year has passed without bringing its tribute of asteroidal discovery in the last of the seventies alone a full score of miniature planets were distinguished from the thronging stars amid which they seemed to move. 1875 brought 17 such recognitions. Their number touched a minimum of one in 1881. It rose in 1882 and again in 1886 to 11. 
dropped to six in 1889, and sprang up with the aid of photography to 27 in 1892. That high level has since on an average been maintained, and on January 1, 1902, nearly 500 asteroids were recognized as revolving between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Of these, considerably more than 100 are claimed by one investigator alone dr max wolf of heidelberg monsieur charlois of nice comes second with 102 while among the earlier observers Polisa of vienna contributed 86 and c h f peters of clinton new york whose varied and useful career terminated july 19 1890 52 to the grand total the construction by Charconat and his successors at Paris, and more recently by Peters at Clinton, of ecliptical charts showing all stars down to the 13th and 14th magnitudes respectively, rendered the picking out of moving objects above that brightness a mere question of time and diligence. Both, however, are vastly economized by the photographic method, Tedious comparisons of the sky with charts are no longer needed for the identification of unrecorded, because simulated, stars. Planetary bodies declare themselves by appearing upon the plate, not in circular, but in linear form. Their motion converts their images into trails, long or short, according to the time of exposure. The first asteroid, number 323, thus detected was by max wolf december twenty two eighteen ninety one eighteen others were similarly discovered in eighteen ninety two by the same skilful operator and ten more through charlois adoption at nice of the novel plan now in exclusive use for picking up errant light specks far more onerous than the task of their discovery is that of keeping them in view once discovered of tracking out their paths, fixing their places, and calculating the disturbing effects upon them of the mighty Jovian mass. These complex operations have come to be centralized at Berlin, under the superintendence of Professor Tietjen, and their results are given to the public through the medium of the Berliner Astronomisches Jahrbuch. The Cui Bono, however, began to be agitated, was it worth while to maintain a staff of astronomers for the sole purpose of keeping hold over the identity of the innumerable component particles of a cosmical ring the prospect indeed of all but a select few of the asteroids being thrown back by their contemptuous captures in the sea of space seemed so imminent that professor watson provided by will against the dereliction of the twenty-two discovered by himself but the fortunes of the whole family improved through the distinction obtained by one of them on august fourteenth eighteen ninety eight the trail of a rapidly moving star-like object of the eleventh magnitude imprinted itself on a plate exposed by herr witt at the urania observatory berlin its originator proved to be unique among asteroids eros is in sober fact one of those mysterious stars which hide themselves between the earth and mars divine or imagined by shelley true several of its congeners invade the martian sphere at intervals but the proper habitat of eros is within that limit although its excursions transcend it in other words its mean distance from the sun is about one hundred and thirty five as compared with the martian distance of one hundred and forty one million miles further its orbit being so fortunately circumstanced as to bring it once in sixty seven years within some fifteen million miles of the earth it is of extraordinary value to celestial surveyors the calculation of its movements was much facilitated by detections through a retrospective search of many of its linear images among the star dots on the harvard plates the little body 
which can scarcely be more than twenty miles in diameter shows peculiarities of behaviour as well as of position dr von oppolzer in february nineteen o one announced it to be extensively and rapidly variable once in two hours thirty eight minutes it lost about three fourths of its light but these fluctuations quickly diminished in range and in the beginning of may ceased altogether evidently then they depend upon the situation of the asteroid relatively to ourselves and so far events lent countenance to mr andre's eclipse hypothesis since mutual occultations of the supposed planetary twins could only take place when the plane of their revolutions passed through the earth and this condition would be transitory yet the recognition in eros of an algol asteroid seems on other grounds inadmissible nor until the phenomenon is conspicuously renewed as it probably will be at the opposition of nineteen o three can there be much hope of finding its appropriate rationale the crowd of orbits disclosed by asteroidal detections invites attentive study the arrest remarked in eighteen fifty one when only thirteen minor planets were known that supposing their paths to be represented by solid hoops not one of the thirteen could be lifted from its place without bringing the others with it the complexity of interwoven tracks thus illustrated has grown almost in the numerical proportion of discovery yet no two actually intersect because no two lie exactly in the same plane so that the chances of collision are at present nil there is only one case indeed which it seems to be eventually possible mr thus pugh has pointed out that the curves traversed by fides and maya approach so closely that a time may arrive when the bodies in question will either coalesce or unite to form a binary system the maze threaded by the five hundred asteroids contrasts singularly with the harmoniously ordered and rhythmically separated orbits of the larger planets yet the seeming confusion is not without a plan the established rules of our system are far from being totally disregarded by its minor members the orbit of pallas with its inclination of thirty four degrees forty two seconds touches the limit of departure from the ecliptic level the average obliquity of the asteroidal paths is somewhat less than that of the sun's equator their mean eccentricity is below that of the curve traced out by mercury and all without exception are pursued in the planetary direction from west to east the zone in which these small bodies travel is about three times as wide as the interval separating the earth from the sun it extends perilously near to jupiter and dovetails into the sphere of mars their distribution is very unequal they are most densely congregated about the place where a single planet ought by bode's law to revolve it may indeed be said that only stragglers from the main body are found more than fifty million miles within or without a mean distance from the sun two point eight times that of the earth significant gaps too occur where some force prohibitive of their presence would seem to be at work the probable nature of that force was suggested by the late professor kirkwood first in 1866 when the number of known asteroids was only 88 and again with more confidence in 1876 from the study of a list then run up to 172 it appears that these bare spaces are found just where a revolving body would have a period connected by a simple relation with that of jupiter it would perform two or three circuits to his one five to his two nine to his five and so on kirkwood's inference was that the gaps in question were cleared of asteroids by the attractive influence of jupiter for disturbances recurring time after time owing to commensurability of periods nearly at the same part of the orbit would have accumulated until the shape of that orbit was notably changed the body thus displaced would have come in contact with other cosmical particles of the same family with itself then it may be assumed 
more evenly scattered than now, would have coalesced with them and permanently left its original track. In this way the regions of maximum perturbation would gradually have become denuded of their occupants. We can scarcely doubt that this law of commensurability has largely influenced the present distribution of the asteroids, but its effects must have been produced while they were still in an unformed, perhaps a nebular condition. In a system giving room for considerable modification through disturbance, the recurrence of conjunctions with a dominating mass at the same orbital point need not involve instability. On the whole, the correspondence of facts with Kirkwood's hypothesis has not been impaired by their more copious collection. Some chasms of secondary importance have indeed been bridged, but the principal stand out more conspicuously through the denser scattering of orbits near their margins. Nor is it doubtful that the influence of Jupiter in some way produced them. Mr. Dufresne's study of the problem they present has, however, led him to the conclusion that they existed ab origine, thus testifying rather to the preventative than to the perturbing power of the giant planet. The existence, too, of numerous asteroidal pairs traveling in approximately coincident tracks must date from a remote antiquity. They result, Professor Kirkwood believed, from the divellent action of Jupiter upon embryo pygmy planets, just as comets moving in pursuit of one another are a consequence of the sundering influence of the sun. Le Verrier fixed in 1853 one-fourth of the Earth's mass as the outside limit for the combined masses of all the bodies circulating between Mars and Jupiter, but it is far from probable that this maximum is at all nearly approached. Mr. Berberich held that the moon would more than outweigh the whole of them, a million of the lesser bodies shining like stars of the twelfth magnitude being needed, according to his judgment, to constitute her mass. And Mr. Neeston estimated that the whole of the 216 asteroids discovered up to August 1880 amounted in volume to only one four thousandth of our globe. And we may safely add since they are tolerably certain to be lighter, bulk for bulk, than the Earth, that their proportionate mass is smaller still. A fairly concordant result was published in 1895 by Mr. B. M. Rosell. He found that the lunar globe probably contains 40 times the terrestrial globe, 3,240 times the quantity of matter parceled out among the first 311 minor planets. The actual size of a few of them may now be said to be known. Professor Pickering, from determinations of light intensity, assigned to Vesta a diameter of 319 miles, to Pallas 167, to Juno 94, down to 12 and 14 for the smaller members of the group. An albedo equal to that of Mars was assumed as the basis of the calculation. Moreover, Professor G. Miller of Potsdam examined photometrically the phases of seven among them, of which four, namely Vesta, Iris, Messalia, and Amphitrite, were found to conform precisely to the behavior of Mars as regards light change from position, while Ceres, Pallas, and Irene varied after the manner of the Moon and Mercury. The first group were hence inferred to resemble Mars in physical constitution, nature of atmosphere and reflective capacity, the second to be moon-like bodies. Finally, Professor Barnard, directly measuring with the Yerkes refractor the minute disks presented by the original quartet, obtained the following authentic data concerning them. Diameter of Ceres, 477 miles, albedo 0 0.18, Diameter of Pallas, 304 miles, albedo, 0 0.23. Diameter of Vesta, 239 miles, albedo, 0 0.74. Diameter of Juno, 120 miles, albedo, 0 0.45. Thus, 
the rank of premier asteroid proves to belong to Ceres, and to have been erroneously assigned to Vesta in consequence of its deceptive brilliancy. What kind of surface this indicates is hard to say. The dazzling whiteness of snow can hardly be attributed to bare rock. Yet the dynamical theory of gases, as Dr. John Stone Stoney pointed out in 1867, prohibits the supposition that bodies of insignificant gravitative power can possess aerial envelopes. Even our moon, it is calculated, could not permanently hold back the particles of oxygen, nitrogen, or water gas from escaping into infinite space still less a globe of one thousand times smaller vogel's suspicion of an airline in the spectrum of vesta has accordingly not been confirmed crossing the zone of asteroids on our journey outward from the sun we meet with a group of bodies widely different from the inferior or terrestrial planets their gigantic size low specific gravity and rapid rotation obviously from the first threw the superior planets into a class apart and modern research has added qualities still more significant of a dissimilar physical constitution jupiter a huge globe eighty six thousand miles in diameter stands pre-eminent among them he is however only primus into paris all the wider inferences regarding his condition may be extended with little risk of error to his fellows and inferences in this case rest on surer grounds than in the case of the others from the advantages offered for telescopic scrutiny by his comparative nearness now the characteristic modern discovery concerning jupiter is that he is a body midway between the solar and terrestrial stages of cosmical existence a decaying sun or a developing earth as we choose to put it, whose vast, unexpended stores of internal heat are mainly, if not solely, efficient in producing the interior agitations betrayed by the changing features of his visible disk. This view, impressed upon modern readers by Mr. Proctor's popular works, was anticipated in the last century. Buffo wrote in his Epoque de la Nature, 1778, la surface de jupiter est comme l'on sait sujet à des changements sensibles que semblant du quai que cette grosse planète est encore dans on est ta inconstance et tourbillonment primitive incandescence attendant in his fantastic view on planetary origin by cometary impacts with the sun combined he concluded with vast bulk to bring about this result jupiter has not yet had time to cool kant thought similarly in seventeen eighty five but the idea did not commend itself to the astronomers of the time and dropped out of sight until mr nasmith arrived at it fresh in eighteen fifty three even still however terrestrial analogies held their ground the dark belts running parallel to the equator first seen at naples in sixteen thirty continued to be associated as herschel had associated them in seventeen eighty one with jovian trade winds in raising which the deficient power of the sun was supposed to be compensated by added swiftness of rotation but opinion was not permitted to halt there in eighteen sixty g p bond of cambridge in the u s derived some remarkable indications from experiments on the light of jupiter they showed that fourteen times more of the photographic rays striking it are reflected by the planet than by our moon and that unlike the moon which sends its densest rays from the margin jupiter is brightest near the center but the most perplexing part of his results was that jupiter actually seemed to give out more light than he received bond however rightly considered his data too uncertain for the support of so bold an assumption as that of original luminosity and even if the presence of need of light were proved thought that it might emanate from oral clouds of the terrestrial kind the conception of a sun-like planet was still a remote and seemed an extravagant one 
only since it was adopted and enforced by zollner in 1865 can it be regarded as permanently acquired to science the rapid changes in the cloud belts both of jupiter and saturn he remarked attest a high internal temperature for we know that all atmospheric movements on the earth are sun heat transformed into motion but sun heat at the distance of jupiter possesses but one twenty seventh at that of saturn one one hundredth of its force here the large amount of energy then obviously exerted in those remote firmaments must have some other source to be found nowhere else than in their own active and all-pervading fires not yet banked in with a thick solid crust the same acute investigator dwelt in eighteen seventy one on the similarity between the modes of rotation of the great planets and of the sun applying the same principles of explanation to each case the fact of this similarity is undoubted cassini and schroter both noticed that markings on jupiter travelled quicker the nearer they were to his equator and cassini even hinted at their possible assimilation to sun-spots it is now well ascertained that as a rule not without exception equatorial spots give a period some five and a half minutes shorter than those in latitudes of about thirty degrees but as mr denning has pointed out no single period will satisfy the observations either of different markings at the same epoch or of the same markings at different epochs accelerations and retardations depending upon processes of growth or change take place in very much the same kind of way as in solar maculae inevitably suggesting similarity of origin the interesting query as to jupiter's surface incandescence has been studied since bond's time with the aid of all the appliances furnished to physical inquirers by modern inventiveness yet without bringing to it a categorical reply zollner in eighteen sixty five merler in eighteen ninety three estimated his albedo at zero point six two and zero point seventy five respectively that of fresh fallen snow being zero point seventy eight and of white paper zero point seventy but the disk of jupiter is by no means purely white the general ground is tinged with ochre the polar zones are leaden or fawn colored large spaces are at times stained or suffused with chocolate browns and rosy hues it is occasionally seen ruled from pole to pole with dusky bars and is never wholly free from obscure markings the reflection then by it as a whole of about seventy per cent of the rays impinging upon it might well suggest some original reinforcement nevertheless the spectroscope gives little countenance to the supposition of any considerable permanent light emission the spectrum of jupiter as examined by huggins eighteen sixty two to sixty four and by vogel eighteen seventy one seventy three shows the familiar freinhofer rays belonging to reflected sunlight but it also shows lines of native absorption some of these are identical with those produced by the action of our own atmosphere especially one or more groups due to aqueous vapors others are of unknown origin and it is remarkable that one among the latter a strong band in the red agrees in position with the dark line in the spectra of some ruddy stars there is besides a general absorption of blue rays intensified as lasoya observed at melbourne in eighteen sixty nine in the dusky markings evidently through an increase of depth in the atmospheric strata traversed by the light proceeding from them all these observations however setting aside the stellar line as of doubtful significance point to a cool planetary atmosphere one spectrograph it is true taken by dr henry draper september twenty seventh eighteen seventy nine seemed to attest the action of intrinsic light but the peculiarity was referred by dr vogel with convincing clearness to a flaw in the film so far then 
native emissions from any part of jupiter's diversified surface have not been detected and indeed the blackness of the shadows cast by his satellites on his disk sufficiently proves that he sends out virtually none but reflected light this conclusion however by no means invalidates that of his high internal temperature end of chapter eight part two